To the borders, Vermonters, come down With your britches of deerskin and jackets of brown With your red woolen caps and your moccasins Come to the gathering summons of trumpet and drum Come down with your rifles, let gray wolf and fox Howl on in the shade of their primitive rocks Let the bear feed securely from pig pen and stall Here's two-legged game for your powder and ball Welcome, sons and daughters of Vermont I thank you for gathering to hear of the bold and thrilling adventures of the Green Mountain Boys. My name is Ethan Allen, and I was a founder of that crew. And my name is Ira Allen, and I was a founder of the state that would become known as Vermont. I was Ethan's younger, better-looking brother. Ha! <laughs> but mine was the, the face that struck fear in the hearts of Tories and Yorkers, from Bennington to Burlington. Come with us as we tell you of life at a time long before Vermont was home to great halls such as these. Before your home stood, when this land was little more than untouched forests and brave settlers. Before the British had left the continent, before our people were free. Come with us to 1738. I was born in 1738 in Litchfield, Connecticut, but my family moved to nearby Cornwall soon after. I watched the town sort of grow up too much around me. It was frontier when my mother and father had started there, but it became a real village as I became a man with wood-framed houses and eventually this young rascal, Ira. I was born when Ethan was already four or thirteen. I grew up listening to him quote scriptures in and out of context, studying with more of an eye and going to Yale College than standing in a pulpit. And he might have if our father hadn't passed away when I was four. Joseph Allen left behind a great deal of wealth and responsibilities. I stayed home for a few years, only for his, for, but for my brothers, excuse me, I stayed home for a few years, looking to get involved in the French and Indian War, to beat back the ravenous French. Uh, by this he means that he volunteered to be part of a militia when he heard the fort was under attack, only to receive news that the fort had fallen and come back home. Ethan returned back to us and saw no action in the French and Indian War. But I'd had my taste of warfare, and the appetite remained. But I settled down for the time being, became part of an iron-working company, marrying Mary Brownson. Mary was a respectable choice, sensible woman. Nag me mad, she did. <laughs> when the ironworks failed, I could leave it behind, but her incessant criticism followed me up into Northampton, Massachusetts, and out again when the town authorities told me I had to leave. I cannot imagine why. And from that day forth, I knew I was destined to retire to the desolate caverns of Vermont and wage war with human nature at large. Now, the first great battle of my brother's life took place outside the Supreme Court of New York. It was a dispute over who had the right to settle on the land we're standing on today. The dispute started when a man named Benning Wentworth, the governor of New Hampshire, began selling land grants, many of them west of his state. Now some would accuse him of greedy self-interest. No, 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 but Benning was not a greedy man. He was a visionary. He sold towns six miles wide by six miles wide, dividing them up into lots, a lot for a school, a lot for a church, for a clergyman, and admittedly, too, for himself. But the towns would be self-governing, run by town meetings attended by the citizens on the first Tuesday of every March, a practice that has never ended in these parts, you might know. And you couldn't just sit on your land until you could sell it for more. No, sir. You had to cultivate it. Five acres every five years for every 50 acres that you owned. And if you bought your land from Wentworth, you owned it and owed no landlord rent. Every man could sit under his own vine and fig tree in the New Hampshire grants. If you could find a fig tree hardy enough to survive our winters. Uh, the Wentworth system worked quite well. But the province of New York didn't like Wentworth's model, nor did they believe he could give away land west of the Connecticut River. I mean, once 128 towns were already under cultivation here, New York swooped in and exclaimed that because Charles II had given James II a grant a hundred years ago, they had the rights to all of this land that Wentworth had already granted. New York had a different model. They preferred to grant large, irregularly shaped parcels of land to their political favorites, who would then let farmers pay them rent for the privilege of cultivating the land. The settlers of the New Hampshire grants were given an ultimatum. They could keep their land if they paid New York the price they had already paid to New Hampshire. But these folks were land rich and cash poor, and they were outraged. What is that, paying a second time for what you'd already bought? I, what does that remind me of? Property tax? That's it. <laughs> 
1770, I was entreated by a group of grant holders to defend their rights before the New York Supreme Court. I rose to the challenge. I went to Albany. I stood before the court, and I hired Jared Ingersoll to defend the New Hampshire grants. And the trial was short, and the court ruled against them, refusing to admit Wentworth grants this evidence because they held they were fraudulently issued. The presiding Chief Justice, Robert Livingston, was himself a major New York grant holder. It was decided before we even spoke a word. I was resolved by some other means, if you get my drift, to strike a blow against the tyrants of New York. Now, I myself was not a grant holder before I was asked to defend the rights of those who were, but Governor Wentworth gave me a tract of a thousand acres in Pulteney and in Castleton. I had found my land and found my people. Ethan met with other settlers at Catamount Tavern in Bennington to discuss their options. We joined in our determination to cast out the unjust judges of New York and not to allow them to survey any land in the grants. We would be free of New York with or without the courts. It was my great honor to be named the Colonel Commandant of this new brotherhood, a group the New Yorkers dismissed as the old Bennington mob, but who were known to every friend of liberty as the Green Mountain Boys. My cousin Seth Warner and remember Baker became colonels. Ira here was also a part of it. I was committed to the cause and began selling my Connecticut property and buying more land up here in the Grants. And that came in handy, too, because as the south of the state became crowded, settlers wanted to buy that land from Ethan. He and I started the Onion River Company with our brothers Heman and Zimri and bought thousands of acres of land. Some of that land became a town I strongly urged and advertised as perfect for settlement. You may have heard of it. Burlington. Business was booming, but... It depended on keeping New York at bay and protecting the grants. One time, some of the Green Mountain boys and I had the unpleasant task of disrupting a group of Scottish settlers down in Rupert. You see, we had to drive them out. We kept two behind. We made them watch as we burned down their houses. That's right. Sent them on their way. And I do it again for every family whose grant I protected here in the New Hampshire grants. It was not out of any personal enmity. Those settlers answered to a tyrant of a New York governor, and I told them they could go complain to him. And they certainly must have, because New York's governor Tryon put a bounty on your head. Ha! And we counted with bounties of our own. Tryon was a vile, ruthless butcher, but he was no match for the men he was sent to try to govern. I mean, after the Boston Tea Party. He was so afraid to bring his own tea ashore to load it off the docks, the New Yorkers dumped their own consignment of tea into their own harbor. That terror wasn't struck into their hearts by my merciful second-in-command, Seth Warner. It was hard acts that drove them back. Governor Tryon became more desperate as he became more thwarted. Bounties were raised fourfold, and he passed a particularly savage act, which made it a capital offense to interfere with a magistrate. We Green Mountain boys passed rules of our own. We forbid anyone from holding any office of honor or profit under the colony of New York. We continued to expel the intruders from our land, and in 1774, I wrote a masterpiece defending our rights, briefly entitled, A Brief Narrative of the Proceedings of the Government of New York Relative to Their Obtaining the Jurisdiction of That Large District of Lad to the Westwood of the Connecticut River. Truly gripping. I thought so. <laughs> Next year, I moved up north looking for some distance from the tumult we had endured and inflamed. I thought I could do some hunting, find land worth buying, have a time of peace. There is a time for peace, you know. But that time was not 1775. March 13, 1775. A New York judge arrives at the few New York settlers in the town of Westminster, New Hampshire Grants. The locals gather outside, angry, not willing to let this New York judge begin his rule. Sheriff Patterson can't get the crowd to leave, so he rides down south to Brattleboro, a town infested with loyalty to New York, to summon a posse to resist the crowd. By the time they arrive, the brave men are occupying the courthouse. Sheriff Patterson demands they leave, and they don't. Someone fires a shot, and one of the men with the sheriff is slightly wounded. And this unleashes their anger. They storm into the courthouse, firing into the crowd. Two men die. Seven are jailed. It was called the Westminster Massacre. The word traveled very quickly. The rioters who escaped rode far and fast and told of what the sheriff and his men had done. 
from down south in Guilford, from out west in Bennington County. They poured into Westminster, farmers, teens, militias, numbering more than 500. They freed the prisoners, seized the judges and sheriffs, paraded them through town and jailed them. They chased out the New York loyalists or captured them and brought them to Northampton, Mass. Court would never again be held in Westminster under New York rule. You see, my friends here in the New Hampshire grants, the sparks of liberty had finally become a blaze. I traveled to Westminster, where the town convention decided to write to King George, asking him to take them out of New York's jurisdiction, and they asked me to draft it. One week after the convention ended, while Ethan still worked on the draft, outright war broke out down in the colonies. Listen closely, my friends. I want to tell you, ever since I have arrived at a state of manhood and acquainted myself with the general history of mankind, I have felt a sincere passion desire for liberty. You know that the history of nations doomed to perpetual slavery in consequence of yielding up to tyrants their natural born liberties, I read with a sort of philosophical horror. So that the first systematical and bloody attempt at Lexington to enslave America thoroughly electrified my mind and fully determined me to take part with my country. The British authorities in Boston, Massachusetts, attempted to seize the military supplies of local patri Patriot militias. The Patriots got word of it and resisted them when they arrived in Lexington and in Concord. Fighting broke out, and the British were driven back, back to the coast, and holed up in Boston, where they remained under siege. It was the point of no return. Massachusetts was at war with Britain. You see, it was the crown that supported New York against us, and it was the crown that the Massachusetts Patriots waged war against. Ira and I had found in the Patriot movement natural allies in our quest for liberty. A Connecticut militia, apparently having heard of the bold exploits of the Green Mountain Boys, sent word that they planned to capture Fort Ticonderoga, a British fort in New York, and they wanted our help. And I was eager to give it to them. Sixty men from Connecticut and Massachusetts met with me in Bennington, where we made our battle plans. I rounded up another 130 Green Mountain Boys, the best of the best, to join them at Castleton, including my old captain, Seth Warner, and we traveled up to Hans Cove in Shoreham to prepare for a raid at dawn. Now, Hans Cove is at the narrowest point right across the Lake Champlain from Fort Ticonderoga. We, the, ca the cannons were pointed right at our faces, only 100 yards away, but the soldiers inside didn't know we were there, and we wanted to keep it that way. And while we had busied ourselves with cutting off all lines of communication to Fort Ticonderoga, a certain soldier named Benedict Arnold had been playing catch-up with Ethan. Benedict carried with him a commission from the Massachusetts Committee of Safety. That pompous braggart showed up in Shoreham waving around his commission papers and claiming that he had the right to lead our expedition. Now, for my part, I would never contradict the Massachusetts Council of Protection. Committee of Safety. Committee of Safety. <laughs> uh, but it seemed that my men simply weren't willing to serve under Arnold's command. Oh, but the poor fellow. He looked so crestfallen, I had to take him aside and assure him <laughs> that he could charge at the front of our battalion at my side. While darkness still shrouded the waters of Lake Champlain, Ethan took 83 men with him aboard the boats. Once they were ashore by the garrison, he sent the boats back for the rear guard which Colonel Warner commanded. A time was running short. The day began to dawn. I feared we would lose the advantage of falling upon the fort while the men inside slept, and so, without advantage of the full strength of our forces, I rallied those ashore, saying, Friends and fellow soldiers, you have for years been a scourge to terror and arbitrary power. <sighs> the British will hear you. Your valor has been famed abroad, or has acknowledged in our orders to surprise and take yonder garrison now before us. I now propose to advance be before you and conduct you through yonder gate, for we must this morning either quit our pretensions to valor or possess ourselves of this fortress in a few minutes. And as it is a desperate attempt, I do not urge it on any contrary to his will. You that will voluntarily undertake it. Poise your firelocks. The men drew their weapons. They advanced at the fort, my brother at the head. When they had reached it, there appeared before them all a sentry who waved his lit torch at Ethan and saw him. I charged the sentry and he fled. The sentry leaped into the garrison, giving a loud hello. 
I assembled the men around the fort, and when we had surrounded it, we gave three. Huzzah! 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 One of the sentries charged forward and gave a slight wound to my friend Gideon with his bayonet. My first thought was to pierce him through, but at the last moment I turned my sword to the side and merely leveled him with it. He dropped his gun and surrendered. Ethan demanded to know where the commander stayed, and the sentry led them to a set of stairs on the west side of the garrison. Bounding up the stairs, Ethan pounded on the door. I demanded that the commander come forward, lest the entire fort should be destroyed. And presently he answered the door with his breeches in his hand. I demanded he hand over the fort to me, and he asked, by what authority I demanded it? I told him, in the name of the great god Jehovah and the Continental Congress. Captain Delaplace surrendered the fort at once. Without a single death on either side, Ticonderoga had fallen. When Seth Warner arrived with the rest of the reinforcements, Ethan sent him forward to the next British stronghold, Crown Point, which he swiftly took, again without losses on either side. The best cannons captured at Crown Point were sent back down to us at Ticonderoga. You see, the cannons captured by the Green Mountain Boys turned out to play a crucial role. Remember the British had occupied Boston and Massachusetts? Well, it so happens that there was a young colonel named Colonel Henry Knox who learned everything he knew about war by reading the books in his bookshop. And one day, he approached General Washington. Your Excellency. Yes, my dear young Colonel, what can I do for you? Your Excellency, I propose to go to Ticonderoga and bring the cannons here and place them at your disposal, sir. Oh, my dear young Colonel, do you realize that you'd be traveling 120 miles over frozen rivers, valleys, lakes, and mountains with no provision? How do you propose to do this? Your Excellency, I have made provision every 35 miles to be refreshed with men, food, donkeys, fresh provisions. I will not fail. Well, my dear young Colonel, may God be with you. And sure enough, good to his word, Colonel Henry Knox went to Ticonderoga, took all of those cannons, coming across the Hudson River, even one fell through the frozen lake, frozen river. They retrieved it, not leaving it behind, and continued their march with provisions refreshed every 35 miles and arrived at the outskirts of Boston and presented it to General Washington good as his word. Now listen, here's the geography. Just south of Boston is Dorchester Heights, which looks down on the town of Boston and the harbor where all of the British ships were. So that that night, General Washington got under cover of darkness, all of those cannons up, placed on Dorchester Heights, pointed down at Boston, pointed down at the harbor, so that when the British general woke up, he said, the Americans have done more in one night than my men can do in six months. Well, of course, general, they're Americans. But anyway, because he saw he was going to be had, there was a negotiation that took place, and the agreement was as follows. General Washington agreed he would not destroy their ships and them as they retreated, if they agreed to abandon the charming habit of burning down the town that they left. Both sides kept their bargain. America recaptured Boston, and it all was because the Green Mountain Boys got the cannons from Ticonderoga. Back at Ticonderoga, we sent the captives prisoner to go Governor Trumbull in Connecticut with Ethan's note. I make you a present of a major, a captain, and two lieutenants of the regular establishment of George III. We bid farewell to Benedict Arnold, who sailed north with 50 men to raid Fort St. John on the Richelieu River for boats and supplies. I figured I could do better and take the whole fort with a hundred Green Mountain boys. On the way north, they met Arnold's fleet, which was sailing back triumphant. They shared their food, since Ethan had forgotten to bring much but tried to warn them not to storm the fort, since the alarm had likely been raised already because of their raid. Jealous that my successes would once again overshadow his own, no doubt. We kept sailing. Arnold was right. When the Ethan and the Green Mountain boys landed on the Richelieu River, they met a sympathetic Canadian merchant who rode ahead to warn them that behind him was a column of at least 200 regulars approaching the fort to defend it. I wrote a message to the noble people of Montreal, sent it back with the merchant, and retired with the Green Mountain boys to the other side of the river. We fell into a deep, exhausted slumber and someone forgot to post a sentry. We were awakened by the sound of the British firing grape shot at us across the river. I took my men back to the boats, and with all our might, we rowed south. All but three left behind in the hasty retreat. Two made it back by land, but one was captured. Ira, I have never left a man behind. 
perhaps uh, only out one one by mistake. After they returned to their fort at Ta uh, Ticonderoga, many of the Green Mountain boys began to return to their homes and farms. Arnold began to assert control over the fort, and with his base of support dwindling, Ethan resigned as commander. I let the braggart have his day, confident that the Continental Congress would reward me for my superior achievements once they had a chance to weigh in. But instead, they wanted to strip and abandon the forts. Even Arnold had brain enough to know how foolish that would be to leave the northern frontier undefended? Crazy. He and I proposed instead that we launch an invasion of Quebec. Uh -huh. I began writing to the local Canadians and Indians to persuade them to side with we patriots. On June 22nd, Ethan went down to Philadelphia with Colonel Seth Warner to make a case to the Continental Congress for including the Green Mountain Boys as part of the Continental Army. It took some deliberating, but they agreed and gave General Philip Schuyler the task of working out an agreement for the organization and payment of a Green Mountain Boy Regiment with the government of New York. Don't turbulent times make strange allies. I, who had frustrated the malicious conquests of New York for years, there I was arguing alongside my friend Seth Warner before the Provincial Congress of New York itself for the establishment of a regiment made of my band of firebrands and rabble rousers. <laughs> their royal governor had placed a price on my head, but we left with official status for the old Bennington mob. And after they had spent a bit of time with their families back home, it was to Bennington they went to spread the news. Ethan went back up to Ticonderoga to join General Philip Schuyler, while uh, uh, did Seth Warner got to work raising the Green Mountain Boy Regiment. I shouldn't have been so eager to return to the fort, you see. I don't know what Seth Warner told the men he rallied, but when we all met in Dorset to hold a vote on who should lead the new regiment, he won overwhelmingly. My good old brother Heman and this rascal over here got plum rolls too, but I got nothing, nothing at all. How the old men came to reject me, I cannot conceive inasmuch as I saved them from the encroachments of New York. Seth was a man of honor, and he didn't need to say anything about you for the men to remember how you botched the attack on Fort St. John. If we were to be allied with regiments from New York, you weren't exactly the friendliest face to have at the front, now were you? Seth Warner had been more merciful to New York settlers than you had been. Well, you can speak well of your honorable lieutenant colonel, but Seth's particular sensibilities about honor never sat well with me, I can tell you, and I suspect you'll soon see why. But I accepted my lot. I went with Schuyler and some of the Green Mountain boys up to Canada. But Schuyler fell sick, was replaced by Montgomery as the head of the invading army. Now, as he began to siege Fort St. John, Montgomery wanted me to secure the southern bank of the St. Lawrence River in case forces at Montreal tried to relieve the fort. I had a better idea. I would just take Montreal itself. Ethan and Major John Brown had been recruiting Canadians between Montreal and St. John. He said that the he thought that he had enough men to take the city while the fort lay under siege, and he said that Major Brown agreed to join him with 200 men, but it's not clear that Major Brown did agree to that, because he did not arrive. Meanwhile, forces in Montreal heard of Ethan's arrival in Long Point, and over 200 soldiers were sent out after him. Ethan's men had made three round trips by boat to cross the river to Montreal by the time they got this news, and when they realized they could not all retreat before the overwhelming enemy forces arrived, they made plans for battle. My army was almost two-thirds Canadian. If more of my Green Mountain boys had followed me, we would have been victorious, yes, sir. But after an hour and a half of exchanging fire, the British scattered my men and outrun us. I, Ethan Allen, had become a prisoner of the British. With Ethan a prisoner, I knew I had to rise up and take his mantle in defending the New Hampshire Grants. And I had to serve the revolution from behind enemy lines. Their wretched General Prescott was going to kill 13 of the captive Canadians who had crossed sides to fight with me. And I stood between them and demanded that he kill me instead. And he said, oh, my dear Colonel Allen, we certainly will kill you, but we'll give you a journey across the Atlantic first. Bon voyage. Angrily, he replied, that I would be hung in England. I was put in a brig angered at Montreal, the HMS Gaspe, where General Prescott saw that I was treated with the cruelest of all possible amenities. 
As my brother languished, his reputation took on a heroic luster, and his example stirred the people of the New Hampshire Grants to decisive action. Holding conventions in Dorset, Windsor, and the site of that famous massacre, Westminster, early in 1775, we declared these grants to be an independent republic, the Republic of New Connecticut. Eh. Bit unimaginative, perhaps? Now, later that summer, we had it changed to one adapted from the French for Green Mountains, the Vermont Republic. Vermont. Meanwhile, I was transferred from the Gaspé to the Adamant, which sailed for England under the command of a merchant named Brooke Watson, who lost a leg to a shark as a boy and all sense of human warmth as a man. The crossing is filthy. And after we arrived in England, we were imprisoned in the notorious Pendennis Castle. I wrote a letter to the Continental Congress telling them how we were treated and recommending they, they, that they treat their British prisoners just as badly. But the letter ended up in the hands of the British cabinet. There had already been controversy about the treatment of American captives, and Ethan's letter only increased their concern that they might invite similar harshness on British prisoners, such as, say, General Prescott, who was captured fleeing Montreal when it fell. It, King George himself decreed that Ethan and his fellow prisoners were to be returned to America and treated as prisoners of war rather than common criminals. They sailed me away first to Cork, Ireland. The Irish locals had heard of me. The kind people of that island took up a collection to provide my men and I with clothing, food, supplies. Then we crossed the Atlantic again and we spent around a year in prison ships off the American coast. One day, in fact, anchored outside New York, the captain of the ship on which I was imprisoned posted my old nemesis, Governor Tryon. I could almost reach out and touch the man who once put a bounty on my head. Back in Vermont, I was doing well for myself, wealthy from the land sales and influential in the new republic. I helped draft the Constitution of Vermont, which banned adult slavery before any constitution of the American states. I also helped design the Great Seal of Vermont over two days at Windsor nearby here. I heard that the British, who controlled New York City, had finally moved Ethan ashore there and given him limited parole. I began supporting him financially, glad to finally be able to do something for my older brother. Ira's generosity made life comfortable again. Despite my longing to continue the fight for liberty, I was refreshed and came to enjoy a little bit of respite of life in New York City. It was time for contemplation of political and religious matters and... But... One day I received word that my only son, Joseph, had died. I wandered off. I, I broke my parole. They grabbed me and put me in solitary confinement. They had no heart, no heart at all. While Ethan was in solitary confinement, Seth Warner led the Green Mountain Boys to victory at the Battle of Bennington alongside American troops. Uh, John Stark was so impressed by Warner's skill that he asked Horatio Gates to recommend him and the boys to Congress. Meanwhile, I stayed behind and took a leading role in the government of the new Repo Vermont Republic. I became our republic's first treasurer under our first governor, Thomas Chittenden. And I was transferred to Staten Island, where I was invited to dine in the quarters of a Scottish general. For two days I stayed, and on the third I found that after two years and eight months of captivity, the British had found someone whose freedom was worth more to them than my captivity. Captain Archibald and I were very happy to see each other. After my release, I went and reported to General Washington at Valley Forge. Ethan made quite the impression on General Washington, who said of him, His fortitude and firmness seem to have placed him out of reach of misfortune. There is an original something in him that commands admiration, and his long captivity and sufferings have only served to increase, if possible, his enthusiastic zeal. I was breveted a colonel in the, in the Continental Army in reward of my firmness, fortitude, and zeal in the service of my country. Had I only known what cause I had to delay these honors, you see, after reporting to Valley Forge, I visited Salisbury, where my brother Heman had been running a general store all these years. I was told that he had died one week before my arrival. Our brother Zimri, who looked after Ethan's family and farm, also died in the spring following Ethan's capture, but losing Eamon, with whom he had always been closest, and just before a reunion might have been possible, hurt the worst. But Ethan continued on to Bennington, 
where the news of his return had preceded him. Though I had been away for the Battle of Bennington, I was greeted as a hero in all my life. I had never been welcomed so warmly and so heartily. We passed the flowing bowl, and rural felicity, sweetened with friendship, glowed in every countenance. I learned that these grants, that this Vermont was now a free state, and one in which my brother Ira had not only done well for himself, but I was able to read with delight the Constitution that he had helped to write. Oh, we were glad to welcome my brother into the Republic's government, and we had just the job for him. Young ladies, young boys, do you know what a Tory is? By a show of hands. Anyone? Yes. Yes, and it was an American who sympathized with the British rather than their own countrymen in the war. Ethan was made one of the judges who decided whether someone was subject to the penalties for being a Tory. Vermont passed the Banishment Act, which allowed us to confiscate and auction off their property. This generated so much revenue for the Vermont Republic, <laughs> it was years before we had to levy any taxes. I would often personally escort these Tories to Albany, New York, and turn them over to John Stark so they could be transported to British lines. Some of these men complained to New York's governor, George Clinton, that they were really only being persecuted because of loyalty to New York. Oh. Clinton didn't want to honor the judgment of our Vermont tribunals, but Stark sided with us, and when the dispute reached the ears of General Washington, let's just say that General Stark's word held more sway with General Washington than Governor George Clinton. Governor Clinton was determined to undermine our fledgling republic. In 1779, he issued a proclamation stating that New York would honor the Wentworth Grants if Vermonters acknowledged New York's sovereignty over our state. But our people had tasted of liberty and had no need to trust New York to preserve and maintain it. What? In other words, we'll establish that you are free if you agree to be our slaves. Not going to happen, Governor Clinton. In response to these romantic proclamations from the tyrant in New York designed to deceive we common woods people over here in Vermont. I penned a pamphlet denouncing the state of New York for their tyrannical intentions. It spread widely even among members of Congress and won many hearts to the plight of Vermont. Seeing how well received my writing was in fact I decided that same year to pen an account of the taking of Fort Ticonderoga and my captivity. It was uproariously popular. But despite the success of Ethan's writings, Congress was slow to act against powerful New York. Ethan had made a case before Congress for recognition as an independent state, but they would not grant it. With Vermont's destiny uncertain, we began talks with Frederick Haldeman. Oh, we do not talk about the Haldeman affair! And why ought we not speak of it? Ladies and gentlemen, I am a patriot in good standing in the state of... You obtain... A patriot of what nation, Ethan? A patriot of the United States? Your pay as a colonel stopped coming in. The Continental Army may have smiled on you for a time, but what did they ever do for you so great as what you and the boys did for them at Ticonderoga? Did they rebuke their beloved Governor Clinton in his hunger for our conquest? No. They did not. You're a patriot of Vermont. You need carry no shame. Well, if we must speak of it, then no, I need carry no shame, because there was nothing shameful in it at all. Nothing I would not have declared to Washington's face, and he would have not thought one less of me as brother. You see, my friends, here's what was happening. The British had begun to invade from the north with their Mohawk and Iroquois allies in the middle of the night to Tunbridge, to Royalton, to Sharon, and burn down villages, carry away men and young boys in the middle of the night. We had no defense against that. What were we going to do? Ask our enemies, the Yorkers, for help? No. We had to use another weapon which we had compared to our enemies in great supply. We were obliged by such dangers to begin a talk with Frederick Haldeman, the royal governor of Quebec. He offered us the opportunity to join Canada as a separate province. Vermont would retain its identity. We who led it would retain our prominence. Governor Chittenden wrote to Congress stating clearly that we were an independent state and had the right to negotiate with the British independently. Hmm, I still maintain that the only thing we negotiated was a prisoner exchange. But if we did talk about joining Canada, it was to postpone an invasion. Hmm. The British would not attack us if we were in talks about joining them, now would we? The Council in Vermont stated officially that my efforts were for precisely that purpose, 
Seth Warner was outraged, suspecting the worst of us, but I was trusted most by those who knew me best. And let me just say this, if word of our dealings got out to Congress and made them, shall we say, hastier to recognize Vermont's borders, well, then all the better. Right, Ira? Be it an American state or a Canadian province, Vermont would remain Vermont so long as I have influence. I will not lose my land. I will not lose my office. Hmm. Well, your point would prove to be moot, fortunately for all of us, because in 1781, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, making it all but certain that the United States would become free and independent. The threat posed by the British Canadians and the leverage they had over us evaporated. We had done our job and staved off our inv the invasion through our drawn-out negotiations. And we were eager to join the 13 colonies as an American state. We had claimed a few extra towns on either side of our original borders with yeah. New, Yo uh, New York yeah. and New Hampshire. Congress agreed to consider us for statehood if we gave the towns back, which we gladly and quickly did, even though we lost Dartmouth in the process. Governor Clinton uh, finally uh, recognized the Wentworth land grants and the land grants of the Vermont Republic. Statehood seemed to lie just around the corner. But Governor Clinton of New York would not let us slip away so easily. Vermont towns like Brattleboro and Guilford remained a stronghold of New York sympathizers called East Side Yorkers. They resisted our government, and Clinton issued judicial appointments for this area the very thing that had led to the Westminster Massacre. I would not allow it. I quickly raised an army of 250 men and marched in Guilford. The ringleaders were arrested, tried, and banished. Congress was angry. They demanded we compensate those affected, <laughs> but we would not. And with the war ending, we were content to wait out the statehood debate and avoid America's war debts while the Americans and the British negotiated the 1782 Treaty of Paris. In 1783, my wife Mary died. I had hoped her continuing disappointment in me had, would have been abated by our successes here in Vermont, but I scarcely got to enjoy our triumphs with her. I once resented her criticism, but in the silence that followed, I longed for her more than I had through all those years of wedded strife. But then, a miracle, I met a woman, Fanny Thrush Buchanan Montessori. We had little in common. Her background was Yorker and loyalist, but somehow of the same troublemaking stock as I. We were drawn to each other quickly, and early the next year, she made this widower smile again. The unbelievable happened. Fanny managed to persuade the hero of Ticonderoga, the scourge of London and Albany, to settle down. For the next five years, Ethan Allen lived a largely quiet, peaceful life. Um, except for that land dispute between Connecticut and Pennsylvania. Yes, except for your role in inflaming another land dispute. But when Daniel Shays launched his infamous rebellion, he offered to crown you King of Massachusetts. <laughs> and what did you do? You sensibly declined and moved your family up north to my beautiful brainchild, Burlington. Fifteen years after Ira and I had founded the Onion River Land Company, I finally got to live right at the very mouth of the beautiful Onion River with Fanny, my wife, Francis, our daughter, and our newborn son, Hannibal. Life was peaceful, far from the intrigues of New England and the encroachments of New York. Burlington, it was a calm retirement for me to enjoy until my next great inspiration. Ethan. But once I had gotten to know the area, one night I walked over the frozen lake to South Hero Island, staying with my cousin. The next day I came back with a load of hay and... I... I love this land. It, it was my whole life. Ethan never had his next great inspiration. As he trudged across the frozen waters of Lake Champlain, he suffered an apoplectic fit. They brought him back across, unconscious. Within a few hours, my older brother was dead. The patriotism and strong attachment which ever appeared uniform in the breast of this great man was worth of his exalted character. 
the public have to lament the loss of a man who has rendered them great service. So read the Bennington Gazette. The Vermonters for whom he had fought mourned him bitterly, but they returned to their homes and farms that he had won for them, no worse for his loss. Not so for me. Ethan had always been there for me to look up to. Ethan, whose passion for Vermont exceeded his investment in it, died two years too soon to see Vermont admitted as an American state. Both of them forever free from the Yorkers. My father died when I was four. Ethan had always been the patriarch of the family. What was my life to become without his example? What legacy was I to seek after? To expand the family land business that we had begun? To fight for our people's independence, as he was so beloved for doing. Could I do both? You see, the family business was at an impasse. I knew we needed a canal connecting Lake Champlain to the St. Lawrence River in Canada to open up the potential of Burlington. That meant digging on Canadian land. I went to London to ask for permission, and they refused me. Just as well. There was a major general in the Vermont militia. I could negotiate with gunpowder. I sailed to France. I bought 20,000 muskets. I headed home on a ship called the Olive Branch. It was only to arm the Vermont militia. It was to arm the Vermont militia for war. Vermonters by land. The French Navy by sea. Together we could take Quebec. Not for a province of France. Not to add on to the United States. No, for a new nation united with Vermont. Partners in destiny. A rival to our neighbors. It was to be called United Columbia. The British intercepted me at sea. They saw the rifles. They didn't know why I had them. I told them it was to arm the Vermont militia. But they said I was furnishing arms to Irish rebels. The lawsuit against me lasted eight years. When I was finally released, I came back to Vermont, found the family land business in ruins. It had been handled so badly without me. I knew I could never repay the debts that had accumulated. So what did I do? I threw a magnificent party. It was my farewell to the land I loved so well. Before it was over, I slipped out a side door sailed south on Lake Champlain, and fled all the way to Pennsylvania. Iris spent the rest of his life in exile from the very state of Vermont, which he had helped to found. After 11 years in poverty, he died in Philadelphia. I pursued wealth and power by means of conquest, just like those I had once fought against. Wealth and power fled from me. Too late did I learn that a life spent well must be a life spent serving a cause that is greater than oneself. It is not only the worthiness of that cause with which we must concern ourselves, it is how we serve it. Even in my retirement, I could never forget the faces of those Scottish settlers whose house we burned down as we made them stand there. I know I did right to defend the Wentworth grants, but did I deal rightly with those on the other side? We have made our decisions. Our legacies have been established. What will you do with your life? with the liberty won by the generations before you, the opportunities in this land. What legacy will you leave in the land of Vermont? Ho, oh, all to the borders, Vermonters, come down with your breeches of deerskin and jackets of brown. With your red woolen caps and your moccasins, come to the gathering summons of trumpet and drum.